evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Whenever we do it right at one of the masses just before this, it's a little bit crazy, but here we are. So we had three of our catechumens there tonight to get presented the creed. So it was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So one more step along the path. Um, so what we're going to do tonight, it'll be a little bit shorter night because um, we're going to be having the second script. So what we're going to do first, of course, is pray. But right after we pray, we're going to get into the next conversion series video, talk about that. Then I'll let everybody go except the elect who are going to be going through the second scrutiny. But it's so similar to the first one, we're going to talk for just about five minutes and then we'll be done. So that's why I say it'll be a little bit shorter. Um, but I'm tempted to take those of you that are here because at the Easter Vigil, I haven't talked about this yet, but at the Easter Vigil, you will actually be wearing um, a gray robe, or it's the best way to describe it. It's a, basically a tunic almost. It's um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. You're talking about the kind of yeah. humans or candidates. It'll be gray. Now underneath it, you're going to be wearing a bathing suit or gym shorts or whatever you want to get wet in. Right? So, uh, but, but what I have to do, we have 15, this year we've got 15 catechumens, which is a pretty big number. And we have like our collection of gray tunics. I know there's a better word than that. I'll come up with the right <laughs> word. But um, so I'm thinking about we'll go up there and start getting people sized up and get in that. And so I can tell because if I need to have some new ones made, I can do that. And I don't want to wait till the last minute. So that's what we might do with our extra time for those of you that are uh, here as catechists. Um, so that's our night. And so if we could, let's just begin with prayer. And then I've got one couple of extra things here to start once we pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. Thank you for this winter little snowstorm we had. And we just, uh, Lord, we just give you thanks for all of the many blessings that you've given us throughout our day. Lord, as we gather here tonight, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit to be here with us. To help us once again to focus in on who you are and who you are calling us to become through your Son, Jesus. And we just ask you, Lord, to uh, open our minds, open our hearts. Help us, Lord, to put away all the distractions, the, the cares and the concerns that we've had throughout the day so that we can be totally focused on You. Because, Lord, at the end of the day, all we want is to do Your will, to make Your will real in our life. And so as we gather here tonight, Lord, please be with us. Bless our discussions. Help us to keep an open mind and heart to all that is said and heard here tonight so that we may draw closer to you as we make this continued Lenten journey towards the Paschal Triduum and towards the eventual resurrection of our Lord. So we ask all these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So first, I want to introduce, we have a new uh, member joining us tonight. His name is Seth Seaman, and he's sitting right back here. Third, back again. Hold your hand up, Seth. So we're like, yes, Seth. All right. And as Seth, kind of our little tradition is we just started actually with a couple of people as we introduced. Uh, you're, just give us a couple of minutes of who you are, what brought you here, just whatever, two or three minutes, and just kind of give us a thumbnail sketch of, uh, of who you are and why you're here. So, okay. Thumbnail sketch of who I am. Okay. Um, well, I'm Seth, Seth Seaman. I'm from uh, the state of Virginia. Um, let's see, I'm actually presently going to Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore. Um, and went there for the purpose of becoming a, a Methodist pastor. Um, and since my time there, kind of, you know, I've seen the beauty within the, the Catholic Church, and at present I'm kind of making a transition. So that's probably, you know, that's a that's a thumbnail. All right. Well, welcome, Seth. So Seth will be joining us. And actually, just to be really clear and specific, Seth was actually baptized in the Catholic Church, but then has, for life, took him other places. So he's actually going through this process, but he's 
really a Catholic who's <clears throat> just now becoming catechized in the faith. And um, so when it gets to the point where he's ready, he will be confirmed and, um, and uh, make his first communion within the church. So that would be just like the candidates, those of you that are already baptized in another tradition, he will not be making a profession of faith because he's already a Catholic by baptism. So if that makes sense, that's the only difference. But other than that, he's going to be here with us and go through these sessions. And when he's ready, just like I tell all you candidates, when you're ready to make your profession of faith, then it's a similar kind of journey that Seth's on, but uh, just with that slight variation because he was already baptized in the Catholic Church. So, um, All right. The, the next little extra tidbit we have here is I've got Pat McGovern, one of our parishioners over here. Pat's with us tonight. And Pat's just going to talk to you a little bit. I've, I've, I've mentioned Build in here before. And Build is, uh, you know, sort of a, our, our, we're one of 27 churches in the Lexington area that are working to bring justice to our city. When we find things that are unjust or unjust, uh, we work to try to eliminate that. And by calling our uh, elected officials to task and to account, and those that have the power to make a change, we ask them to do that through this organization called Bill. Um, so I'll let Pat tell you kind of what we're getting, and, and just to kind of make it real tight, you know, Bill has this process it goes through on a yearly basis to identify issues that we want to work on, then go seek out, do research, find out what are some solutions that are out there that actually work. So we're not just sort of blowing smoke, of, well, hey, make it better. We're not just telling people to make something better, we're actually saying, here's a way we can make it better. And then finally, the big event, which Pat's going to talk to you about tonight, is when we bring our elected officials into this one event, one time a year, called the Nehemiah Action, and ask them to make a change for the better in our city. So that's built in like 25 seconds, um, but I'm going to let Pat kind of tell you a little bit more about what we're trying to do here to get ready for that Nehemiah Action. Tim, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and I'm delighted just for this opportunity to take the word to this group, as I've been doing with several other ministries within uh, our faith community. But as Deacon Tim just mentioned, uh, our goal this evening just is to, a to raise awareness of this group, this interfaith group, who are doing incredible work and have been doing over the years, identifying, as Tim said, as Tim said, problems within our community that do have solutions. And uh, maybe not perfect solutions, but they've worked hard on them and they're prepared to present to the powers that be pretty well baked ideas on how to accomplish, uh, I guess, raise the quality of life within our community. And what I'm going to ask this evening, or what I have volunteered to do in the spirit of my Lenten journey, or with the gentle nudging of my dear wife, she said, Well, you promised to do something do more than give up something so here's my do more volunteer and we're asking that as many people as possible can see their way to committing two hours two hours on uh, April the 12th and we have little say the day <coughs> tags here to go to basically to the Rupp Arena it's very all in the Rupp Arena about seven at seven o'clock to eight thirty, and to show our support for this group, who are in fact working on our behalf, I guess, uh, to raise uh, the standard of living, the quality of life within our community. He mentioned just three, pro and each year the projects are identified. This year, and it's the, the particular projects are listed on the back of this save the day. One has to do with the struggle that many families have in finding mental health aid and support, many within our own families, and the group have identified ways to make that process a little bit better. Secondly, they've identified payday pay lending as an extreme burden on many of the poorer folk in our community, and they're willing and able to present solutions or partial solutions to lighten the burden. And thirdly, 
uh, they're working on ways to reduce crime in our neighborhoods, make our city uh, safer. So, my thought tonight then would be if I will hand out, if we do yeah. Tim's help, just reminders that on April the 12th, these proposals will be presented to the powers that be. And as with any presentation, if there seems to be lukewarm support within the community for these ideas, well, you can imagine what happens. Very little, no matter how good the idea is. So we're hoping to rally as many, many people as possible to be there on that evening. So if you may be willing to make a commitment tonight, that would be super. Tim, I'd like to leave this little sign-up sheet maybe on the table. And if you would, before you leave, sign it with your contact <coughs> uh, telephone number, and I will get you a ticket. That's the whole idea. For, uh, I'll be getting tickets on March the 15th, and we will get parking instructions and so forth to you to attend. So, thank you. Please, the Holy Spirit will somehow, uh, as it seems to move us on certain times, uh, see your way to doing this. It would be a great Lenten uh, account. Thank you. And the time is 7 p.m.? Yeah, this time is 7. It seven starts at 7, ends at 8 30. 7 p.m. Yeah. yeah, 7 p.m. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And yeah, and just, just, so, just to add on to what Pat's saying. so. You know, if you look at social, Catholic social teaching, which we've talked about, there's sort of two arms of that, right? There's the charity and justice arms of those two things. Uh, and and charity is really easy for people to get, right? Somebody's hungry, we go feed them. Somebody doesn't have the clothes they need, we collect clothes and we give them to them, right? It's it's like immediate need kind of stuff. We do a great job of that here at Christ the King. And anybody, you can be a hundred member church and do that, right? The justice side of the equation is a whole lot harder to deal with, and I know we've talked about this, but just as a reminder, we are pretty big, we're the biggest Catholic church in the diocese, but if we go down to the mayor's office, he's gonna say, well, you know, okay, I'll listen to you for five minutes, and as soon as we leave, he's forgotten us, because we don't have enough power to make a difference in his on his radar. When you bring 27 congregations together and you get behind a cause, and you have 2,000 people, which is what we're hoping to get at Heritage Hall and the chief of police comes in the door, he's going to look, he's going to at least listen to what we have to say, right? So this whole side of justice is a much more difficult thing, not only to comprehend, but to actually make something happen. So what I love about Bill, and I've been involved with it myself for about eight years and here at Christ the King for about three years, is that it's effective. Some of the things we've done are incredible that to make our city a better place to live. And uh, there's a vision sheet that I will send out to all of you so you can actually see the accomplishments of what's happened. And uh, so trust me, you come this year just on faith. Like, if you trust me, come to this thing. Because the first time I went, I trusted the person that asked me. And I showed up and I was like, oh my gosh. Look what happens when a people of faith come together. And like in the Old Testament, the reason we call it the Nehemiah action is Nehemiah was a sort of a mid-level official in his country and the people were getting cheated out of their money and they were at, they were being asked they were getting taxed on stuff they'd already paid taxes on and so Nehemiah he didn't have the power himself but he basically called this meeting and he brought the leaders in and said hey we're we're doing wrong by the people and because there was a crowd there the leaders relented or made said you're right we're, we're going to change what we've been doing and there was so that's kind of like why we call it the nehemiah action so the idea here is to call our officials together and say look we need you to take action here to make a difference in our city so come this year on faith and i guarantee if you come and you see how it all works you're you're gonna hopefully you're gonna say wow there's something here and next year you'll come because you've actually seen it and experienced it. The other thing, so we've got a, a, an objective here of 200 people from, the, from this congregation, okay? The ultimate vision of BUILD is we call it 52-1. So if one time a year we're gonna get together to ask our officials to make our city better, we ought to be able to bring the same number of people that we worship together 52 times a year every Sunday 
which for us is like 2,000, 2,200 people, we ought to be able to bring 2,200 people to this one-time action. But that is going to require people that are learning and understanding what this is all about. Right now, we have 200 is our objective. Last year, we had 130, I think, is where we came out last year. So if you come, just come on April 12th. Bring your friends, your family, your, your three-year-old counts. That's a person. Oh, yes. Bring your right? family. So they, bring your family. So people that live under your roof come. Do them on your. Yeah. Yes. You just, yeah. You put just put a number. If I'm yes. coming with two people, just put down. I get tickets for the, yeah. the whole group. Yeah. So anyway, um, so that that's just something you can do. It's a great it's a great use of your time, and it's just like it's a 90 minutes. Hey, two hours of count the travel. So. Um, all right. So yes. you have to get tickets prior to it, or you can Well, you can show, show up. up, but the nice thing about the tickets is it has the congregation's name on it, so when you turn it in, it's easy for everybody to count whose pair, whose church they're coming from. Okay. So that's why we have the tickets. So we'll get you the tickets if, if that's. You know, I, I can bring them here, right? I can get them here. So anyway, there you go. Any questions about Bill? And again, that's April 12th. You got the, the information. Okay. I think that's all the preliminaries here tonight. Um, let's go ahead and get started with Now the first story I want to look at is the only time I look at the Old Testament. Five of our stories are from the Gospels. This is alone from the Old Testament. The Great Book of Jonah. Jonah is one of the shortest books in the Bible. You can easily read it in one sitting. It's also one of the funniest books in the Bible. One problem is we always read the Bible in these very solemn tones, but much of it is actually quite funny, and Jonah is a prime example. It's also an archetype of the spiritual life. We also find in this story the basic steps of spiritual conversion. How does the story begin? Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it for their wickedness has come up before me. Basic truth of the Bible. We are a called people. Every great figure in the Bible is called from outside himself or herself. Now contrast this with both the ancient world and the modern world. You look at the great ancient philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, Cicero. The ideal for them was the self-directed life. I decide what I'm going to do, I set my agendas, my goals, I determine the goods I want to seek, and I do it. The aristocratic person in control of his life, that's the ancient ideal. Now the modern ideal, what we saw earlier. I'm in charge of my life, I'm self-directed, self-motivated, I know where I'm going. None of that is biblical. The biblical heroes are placed in the passive voice, all of them. They're called. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. We are a summoned people, placed in the passive voice by the great will of God, which absorbs ours, envelops ours. Remember Paul to the Ephesians? There's a power already at work in you that can do infinitely more than you can ask or imagine. The idea now, surrender to it. Stop relying so much on your own will and surrender to this higher will. Listen to this higher voice. That's the biblical imagination. What's the call in your life? My life? What's the summons to Nineveh? In Jonah's case, go preach. Be a prophet. Maybe in your case, if you're a lawyer, is to instantiate justice. To make justice the central preoccupation of your work. God, after all, is justice itself. And so when you, as a lawyer or a judge, allow justice to work through you, that's God working through you. That's God placing you in the passive voice. Maybe you're a writer. You're a critic. You're a newspaper person. Allow the truth so to seize you that the truth motivates you in all of your works and all your efforts. Look, God, after all, is the truth itself. And so when you allow truth to dominate your life, to determine what you do, 
You are following the call of the Lord. You're placing your own will in the passive voice. Suppose you're a doctor, you're a nurse, you're a medical technician. Allow love, the concern for the other, so to seize you that it determines all that you do. God, after all, is love itself. And so when you do that, you are following the call to Nineveh. Look at it. All of us are called. All of us have a mission. In some way, God, the good itself, the true itself, the beautiful itself. Let's say you're an artist. You're an artist. What seized you? A desire to make beautiful things. That's God who seized you. The good, the true, the just, the beautiful itself. When they grab hold of you and you allow them to surge through you, you're responding to God's call. John Henry Newman, one of my heroes, said, we've all been made for a definite purpose. Here's the whole of your life. You've been made for a definite purpose. Find it. Listen to it. That, by the way, is the pearl of great price that Jesus talks about. When you find that pearl, sell everything else you've got and buy it. That's everything. That's the summons here. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Jonah, get up. I've got a mission for you. Now, what does Jonah do with this call? Lord, you want me to go east by land. I'm going to go west by sea. <laughs> Jonah gets on a boat. And he makes his way to Tarshish. Tarshish for biblical people, that was a city at the far western end of the Mediterranean. You want to know our translation of that? Timbuktu. That's what it meant for them. He got on a boat to go as far away as he possibly could from where God wanted him to be. Ah, the central drama of the spiritual life. What do we do with the call? The saint is the one who responds so fully to that call that she makes it the central organizing principle of her life. That's what a saint is. We sinners, to varying degrees, we're the ones who hop on boats to Tarshish. <laughs> you know? We know what God wants, and we move in the opposite direction. God's call, of course, is, by its very nature, difficult. Thomas Merton, the great spiritual writer, once said, if you're facing a choice, option one is relatively easy, option two, relatively hard, option two is what God wants. <laughs> God's call is hard because it's always a call to love. In whatever form, your lawyer serving justice, your doctor serving love, your writer serving the truth, love means letting go of oneself, giving oneself away. So yes, it's always hard, which is why we face the Jonah temptation to hop a boat to Timbuktu when God calls. Now, what happens? Well, Jonah goes down to the bottom of the boat and he falls asleep. Ah, always a bad sign in the Bible. When people fall asleep, think of the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Couldn't you watch one hour with me? To fall asleep in the biblical symbolism is not to be aware, not to get it, not to see. Jonah is oblivious to this. But what's going on around him? A great storm kicks up. Well, again, for the biblical people, they were very afraid of the sea. You can see in all kinds of ancient writings. Indeed, St. Augustine in the 4th century talks about how terrified he was when he had to cross the Mediterranean from North Africa to Italy. Terrified him. What makes those little rickety boats they had going out in the high seas? Whenever they would travel, usually they would skirt the shore, stay very close to the shore. So the image of being out in a boat on the high seas, and it's tossed around by the waves. Think, by the way, of the biblical story, right? The New Testament story of the disciples in the boat during the storm. That terrified ancient people. So there's Jonah asleep, and everybody on the boat is being rocked by this terrible storm. What's caused it? Jonah's resistance. Oh, it's a hard truth, Christians, but a very deep truth. 
when we resist our call, storms kick up, trouble ensues. We've been made for a definite purpose, right? When we resist it, trouble, storms, difficulty. More to it. Trouble just for Jonah? Uh -uh. Trouble for everybody on the boat. Remember I said earlier, we are all connected. Our lives are intertwined. Beautiful? Yes, it is beautiful. And it's got this dangerous overtone. It means when you live your mission, think of Matthew responding to his call, you attract all kinds of people. You benefit all kinds of people. Oh, but the opposite truth, when you don't follow your mission, trouble ensues around you. Think for a second. Let's say you're a lawyer. When you're a young man, you were seized with this great desire to do the work of justice. Oh, that God's justice would surge through me for the good of the world around me. Beautiful. That's your mission. You were made for that definite purpose. But now as your life is worn on, you cave in more and more to your own egotistical desires. Money means more to you than justice. Whom is that hurting. You, yes, yes. And all those around you who should have benefited from your dedication to justice. You're a writer. When you were a young woman, you said, I want the truth to surge right through me. I want my pen and my mind to serve God's truth for the benefit of the world. As your life wears on, somehow comfort, safety, security, Material things become more important to you than the truth. Who's rocked in the stormy sea? You, yes. And all those around you who were meant to benefit from the truth that you would tell and you didn't tell. Oh, it's important to meditate on this. Our lives are not about us. Our good choices and our bad choices have consequences for us and for those around us. They determine Jonah's the problem. Let's throw him overboard. So all the people, they wake up Jonah. And Jonah, I love how acquiescent he is. The guy's like, okay, you're right. I know, I'm the one. And so they pick him up, they throw him overboard. And immediately the storm calms down, the sea is okay. And there's Jonah. What comes along, of course, the great fish. Oh, how many artists and poets, by the way, have loved this scene up and down the centuries. One of the best uh, commentaries on Jonah, by the way, can be found in Herman Melville's great novel, Moby Dick. Remember the beginning of Moby Dick? Father Matwell comes out, or the minister comes out. He gets up into this pulpit shaped like the prow of a ship. And boy, does he give a rip-snorting homily on Jonah. You know, read that to get a good commentary. So there's Jonah. The great fish comes and swallows him up. First lesson. There's no running from God. You know, I mean, <laughs> Jonah thought that God was a local deity. You know, maybe he just controls that part of the world. So if I just hightail it to Tarshish, I'll be fine. No, no, Thomas Aquinas, God is not a being whom I can run away from. God is the sheer act of being itself. Therefore, that undergirds and run through, runs through and suffuses all things. Remember Psalm 139? Paul Tillich, the theologian, read it as a sinner's lament. Where can I run from your love? I climb to the heavens and you're there. I go to the depth of the earth and there you are. I go to the sea's furthest end, even there your right hand holds me up, behind and before you besiege me, your hand ever laid upon me. Where can I get away from you? You can't. That's the point. Even the whale. Even the whale in the depth of the sea obeys God and serves God's purpose. And the whale swallows him up. What does that great symbol mean? Our wills, when they are resistant to God, need to be swallowed up by the divine will. Our wills are meant to be enveloped by God's will so that they might perform God's work and do God's service. And so Jonah is caught, swallowed, enveloped by the divine will. And all of that is to the good. 
One way to read our lives, God's constant attempt to swallow us up according to his own purposes. To envelop us, surround us. Dante said, Lord, in your will is my peace. Not, not my will that runs to Tarshish, but rather your will that envelops me and moves me where you want to go. That's where I find peace. Hard for Jonah? Uh-huh. Locked up. Confined in the darkness of the belly of the fish. Watch this, please, in almost all the great heroes of the Bible. Joseph. Remember Joseph with the amazing technicolor dream coat, right? The favored son of his father Jacob. Joseph, so full of himself, that he goes to his brothers, he says, I had a dream that one day you will bow down to me. Kind of no wonder they threw him into a well and sold him into slavery, you know? Can you imagine this, this obnoxious kid, so full of himself? The day will come, of course, when he is a great figure. The day will come, of course, when they do bow down to him. But what if that had happened when he was 12? He would have been unbearable. He would have been the worst leader. He was instead thrown down into the well, confined, then sold into slavery. While he was serving as a slave in the house of Potiphar, do you remember? He was falsely accused and he was sent to prison for seven years. Joseph was swallowed up, confined, limited, tested, tried. And when he emerged from that experience, yes, he was the great vizier of Egypt presiding over the feeding of the world. And Joseph did indeed become a great figure, serving God's purposes. But he only needed, he needed his will to be enveloped, his will to be swallowed and disciplined, so that he would be ready to do God's work. Think of Moses, prince of Egypt, right? Probably raised in splendor, used to the finest things, getting what he wanted. What's the first thing we hear about Moses? He sees one of his brother, Hebrews, being abused by an Egyptian. So he kills the Egyptian, buries him in the sand. Huh. There's someone in control of his emotions, huh? <laughs> There's someone whose life is in order. Come on. Come on. Is he destined to be a great leader of his people? Yes. Is he destined to do great work for God? Yes, of course. But boy, did he need to be swallowed up for a time. He's sent into the desert for many years. He's not a prince anymore. He's a common shepherd. And only after many years of this ordering and discipline is he ready. Now, Moses, get up and go back and liberate my people. Christians, here's the thing. How do we read the times when we feel swallowed up by the whale? You know what I'm saying? The times of darkness, of dryness, of despair, times we feel we've lost our way, times we feel we're not getting what we want, our plans aren't being fulfilled, my life's not going where I want it to go. How do we read those times? We can read them as simply dumb suffering. Or we can read them as the discipline of God. You know what I'm saying? As the swallowing up of our wills so as to try us and test us and conform us unto the divine will. Beautiful detail in this book is Jonah prays from the belly of the whale. Good. God's everywhere. It's easy to pray when times are going well. You know, it's easy to pray. Hey, Lord, thank you for these great blessings. But pray especially when you're in the belly of the fish. Pray especially when you feel life is not going your way, when you're hemmed in. God can hear. In fact, those prayers are very efficacious, I think. Jonah prays. And then what do we find out? The whale has taken him all the way back to shore and spews him up right near Nineveh. <laughs> Jonah, that's where I want you to go. 
no, no, Lord, I'm going to Tarshish. I'll send a fish then to swallow you up and take you right back where I want you to go. So it is sometimes that the darkest periods in our lives, the driest, most difficult periods, might be precisely the vehicle through which God is bringing us back precisely where he wants us to be. And so, and so, when he finally gets to Nineveh, and one of the funniest parts of the story, Jonah preaches. And everybody repents. Every single person from the king to the cattle. The cattle put on sackcloth and ashes. They repent too. He becomes the most powerful prophet in history. When we start cooperating with God's will, miraculous things happen. You know what I'm saying? That's when the grace of God flows through us, when we begin cooperating with his will. But Jonah needed the discipline of the fish to bring him precisely there. Just one more point here I want to make. One of my favorite theologians is Hans Urs von Balthasar, a temporary theologian. He's a favorite, by the way, of, of both John Paul II and our current Paul. He says this, in the biblical vision, mission and person are tightly linked. That means you know who you are when you find your mission and you do it. You know who you are when you hear that voice and say, yes, Lord, that's my mission, and then you do it. Which is why in the Bible, so often, when people get their mission, they change their name. Abram becomes Abraham, right? Jacob becomes Israel. Simon becomes Peter. Saul becomes Paul. Because you become a new person when you take on this mission from God. So when the call comes, listen to it. Don't run the Tarshish. And then you find out who you are. Thanks. I forgot about the conversion. I, this, this has been such a good, this is only my second year doing this, but um, I hope you, I'm getting a lot out of these. Again, seeing them for the second time and hearing the discussion. Uh, and especially for those that are getting close to uh, coming into the church, I just hope that this is um, getting maybe you excited and anticipating the what's going to happen to you here in a few weeks to a couple of months from now, and um, that there is a, a, an anticipation because I anticipate it for you, and I hope you're getting there, and um, and just to know that Christ is calling you and you've been responding to the call, and I see a lot a, a lot of growth and deepening of, of that call and, and a recognition of it, so. Um, I'm, I'm excited for you. I hope you're getting excited too. So, um, well, next week I forget. Let's see. Who is it here? I don't know if I have it here. Yeah, here we go. Next week we'll be talking about the woman at the well, which is actually what we're reading from last week, last Sunday. Um, so that'll be kind of a good connection. There. Um, so on the schedule this weekend, this Sunday at the five o'clock Sunday mass is our catechumen, our elect are going to be second scrutiny. So the second of three scrutinies. Um, so that's going on. Uh, there is no Thursday night right next week, so that's why we're having a little bit shorter thing here. We don't have to prepare for any right on Thursday. Um, and the only other thing which I sent out in the note was, we, for again, for the elect on Holy Saturday, the preparatory rites to get ready for the vigil are going to be at 11 o'clock Saturday morning in the Adoration Chapel. Um, so we'll do that there with Father Paul. And it uh, takes about an hour, a little less than an hour probably. So um, so that's that's on the schedule now with the time on it. Um, and you'll need to have your godparents there. So, um, also, we're, we're supposed to be there the night before, right? With the sponsors? No, the, the night before is a practice with just the sponsors. Okay. You guys, it's a secret. Not really. No, no. So just honestly, here's what the reason I have the, the godparents come, and I think I said this a time before, but when you go through the vigil, you need to go through it and just experience it moment to moment to moment and not be thinking, when do I have to say this? When do I have to go over there? Because there's a lot of stuff that happens. So what we're going to do is go through with the godparents and say, it's your job to worry for, the, for your person when you have to do this get up and do this we're going to go over here now you're going to be walking with them 
So the godparents are going to have to know all the gory details. You guys are just going to literally do whatever somebody tells you. And, and the responses you're going to have to give aren't things that have to be memorized. They're short responses, so it's not you don't have to worry about all that. Um, but we really want it to be, it's intended to be an experience for you, and that's why godparents are there. It's, in a sense, they've been walking with you all along the way, but this is one of their specific things they can do to help make this a more richer, more abundant experience. So, um, so that's what we're going to do on Friday at 5. So you get off, you don't have to do anything except come to the Good Friday services if you want. So. All right, so um, at this point, um, I will just dismiss the candidates. And you guys, I again, encourage everybody to go up to the Adoration Chapel and spend a few minutes with the Lord on your way out. And uh, we'll see you next week. All right, so the second scrutiny is literally, I went through the right today and, and uh, looked at the first scrutiny. It's, it's exactly the same in terms of when things happen, what you do, you come up with your sponsor, you're going to line up across just like we did. Um, the only thing that's different are the prayers, um, the, well, the prayers of the faithful, which again, you guys probably won't know the difference anyway. They're different than the first time, but... You don't have to worry about those. They're, they're, the deacon says those. And the, the, the prayer um, before, he's going to come and impose hands mm -hmm. like he did. And there's a prayer before, if you remember, and there's a prayer after. The prayer's different. And that's it. And we, we, don't, say, we don't say them. <laughs> you don't say them. So again, you're probably not going to know the difference. And I was just looking at it. Really, they, they, they work the scripture into the prayer. That's why it's different. Because we heard a different gospel last week than we'll hear this week. So, so again, that's why we really don't need to go through anything. Because you're going you're gonna to do exactly the same things. But I will send the script around because it's done. I just did it. I'll send it around. And that way, again, I always say use this as a way to pray. Reflect on it. Spend some time in prayer. And... Uh, because then when you hear it, it'll just resonate even more. So, um, but that's really all we need to do. And um, if you guys don't mind, I'll turn off our camera. We can go up to the closet. And for the people that are at home uh, listening to this, um, we're going to, you know, have these the gray robes. And and uh, so we'll just go up and take a quick peek. And since you guys are here, we can let you. We can find one. We'll mark it and and that way uh, and, then I, and then I can start by a process of elimination to figure out how many you know either large or small because I got five kids under 12 and then so that's uh, what and then I have um, 10 10 of 10 adults so um, just kind of count. now these are pretty baggy this is not like you know size 8 10 12 14 there's like three size three or four sizes so uh, but they're they're you know they're just slip over and you know it's not going to be a style statement, right? So don't want to worry about that. Are we going to take your robes home and then get out of the car? No, no, no. They'll stay here. Okay. So yeah. No, you're going to come. Um, I mean, come in. Like well, for the ladies, I always say come in like a bathing suit, right? Underneath. Now you can wear whatever you want in here. Well, I'll have a place where everybody can change. The men's and the women's room in the ad near the Adoration Chapel is like the dressing rooms. So we'll dress there. I know you start off in the gray. I'm trying to think. What happens to Gabrielle after their bath? Mm -hmm. Right. But when then when they back, come out in, they all come back out and they're dressed in their white robes. There. In the white robes. And their yes. godparent gives you your candle. Right. And we're dre we're dressed in our Sunday best under the white robes. Right. Well, you, you'll be able to change into the restroom into whatever you want. Bring dry clothes, in other words. Bring dry clothes. Yeah. So your suit or whatever. And yeah, but you're going to put on a white robe on top. So we have both gray and black.